Hey, what's up everyone? Danny here. This PC next to me marks my very first time ever building a system using a discrete Intel desktop graphics card. This is really exciting because now we have a true third competitor when it comes to mainstream graphics cards, which in time will hopefully work in favor of the consumers. And I say hopefully because we've already had competition in the desktop GPU space for a good number of years now, but look at this distribution on the Steam hardware survey. Not really balanced at all if you ask me. But maybe now having two underdog competitors can turn the tides and even it out a little bit more, but we're going to have to wait and see on that. For this build, my goal was to keep the total price below $1,000. I think that's pretty reasonable given that these new Intel ARC cards cost around like $300 to $350. So it'll be roughly a third of the total budget, which I think is very normal. Also for this build, in honor of it being my first time using a discrete Intel card, I decided to make it as Intel as possible, so wherever I could, I'd use an Intel part, which really only works out to be the CPU, GPU, and the SSD, but hey, it's still going to be the most Intel system I've ever built. And by the way, this video is not sponsored by Intel in any way, shape, or form. It is, however, sponsored by Micro Center, though, who is always a pleasure to work with because they pretty much give me free reign in my videos to do whatever I want, and they completely trust my vision. They're a beloved company within the tech community because of their long-term reputation of having great prices and customer service, as well as constantly running banger deals year-round. Like right now, they're running a new customer special for $25 off any, yes, you heard that right, any processor, not just the old one, ones that they need to clear inventory of, not just for the unpopular ones that your favorite tech content creators told you to stay away from. No, $25 off of any processor you want, even the newest stuff, even the stuff that was already great freaking value to begin with. To top it all off, when you buy a pairing motherboard, you can save another $20. Check out the links down in the description for more details. Okay, so as always, I'll have all the parts or alternatives listed down below in the description so you can check them out. But let's go over what's inside this system. I'm going to start with the graphics card for once because it really is the most exciting part about this build for me. We've got the Intel Arc A770. This is their 16GB limited edition model and it comes in at an MSRP of $350. There's also an 8GB version which MSRP is at $330 and I've seen both of these going in and out of stock pretty regularly across the online retailers. So if you're really trying to get your hands on one, it should be a little bit easier than what we were dealing with during the peak pandemic shortages. This is considered a mid-ish range card and it's going to compete both price and performance wise with the likes of NVIDIA's RTX 3060 which I do have one right here uh, as well as AMD's RX 6650 XT which I also have right here so uh, later on during the benchmarks I'll actually be showing how all of these stack up against one another I'll show the results for gaming performance as well as different workloads like blender video editing and photoshop Keeping with the theme of Intel, next up we have the processor, which I went with the Intel i5-12400. You could alternatively go with the 12400F, which costs a little bit less due to lacking integrated graphics, but I figured that having an iGPU may come in handy in case I experienced any issues with the A770 and had to troubleshoot. Even with 13th gen out right now, I think this processor still provides phenomenal value. At this budget, it's just hard to fit in a 13600K, which is the most inexpensive 13th gen chip available right now, but still comes in at a whopping 3 hundred dollars by itself. I wasn't really concerned about CPU bottlenecking when pairing the 12400 with the A770 and you'll see why later on during the benchmarks. I stuck with the stock cooler in this build. The 12400 doesn't run all that hot and this gets the job done but as always feel free to upgrade to a 20 or 30 dollar tower cooler if you want to lower the temps and fan noise a bit more. For the motherboard we've got the MSI Pro B660MA. This is a very solid board that sets you up for a future upgrade down the road if you're the type of person to stay on a platform for as long as possible. Remember the 600 series motherboards are compatible with 13th gen Intel. It's the same LGA 1700 socket and just requires a BIOS update. If you don't care about future proofing and you typically replace both your CPU and motherboard together when upgrading then you can go with something cheaper like Gigabyte's DS3H which would work just as well. In terms of memory we've got 16 gigabytes of Team Group T4 Force Delta RGB rated at 3200CL16. Nothing too fancy here. For storage, we've got the final Intel branded part in this build, a 1TB 660p NVMe SSD. Is this the best drive they can get out there? Nope. Far from it actually, but is it one of the cheapest ones that will work perfectly fine for the majority use cases of most people? Yes. Next up is the power supply, which we've got a 550 watt ASUS ROG Strix 80 plus gold unit. I've mentioned this before in other videos and streams, but power supply prices are still kind of wacky at the moment. This unit MSRP is for $70 and was going for that much across multiple retailers. 
At $70 for a very quality, well-built, top-tier power supply like this that includes a 10-year warranty, I think that price can be justified given how important a power supply is for a system. But I've been seeing the price be hiked up across multiple sellers though, up to $90, which at that point I'm thinking is getting a little bit too pricey, especially for 550 watts. The issue is though, a lot of previously more affordable options that used to be found for around $40 to $50 have also seen a pretty massive price hike. So as always, be active in deal hunting and pick up a decent unit that fits within your budget if you're going by the tier list i'm personally comfortable with anything that's c tier or better but i know some people out there only want b tier and above do what's right for you last but not least the case which i went with the thermaltake versa h18 micro atx this is one of the budget cases that i wanted to cross off of my bucket list i pretty much want to use as many cheap cases as i can at least once so that i can make a personal recommendation for them or not Coming in at $50, its features definitely reflect its low price. It doesn't really have too much going on for it that makes it really stand out from other cases. It's got the usuals like tempered glass side panel, power supply basement, and of course that low price point. Not much other than that though, it's pretty basic. In terms of downsides, there's only a single fan which is placed at the rear for exhaust. It does use four thumb screws through holes on the tempered glass to hold it into place. And that LED strip in the front is powered by Molex. Personally, I think a better value case would be something like the Montec Air 100 which improves in some of these areas with four included adjustable RGB fans as well as a hinged glass panel design for only $15 more. All right, let's take a look at the overall build list and price summary. This all comes in just a hair over $900, though as I've mentioned earlier, there's different ways to modify it and swap things out for alternatives, with two key things, I think, being the motherboard and the power supply. There are some cheaper options for both of these available that would be perfectly viable and bring the cost down a little bit. Here's a quick montage of me assembling the build, followed by some glamour b-roll shots of it once it was completed. All right, time to take a look at the performance. As I said earlier on in the video, I tested the A770 as well as the closest equivalents from both AMD and Nvidia. So you're also gonna see the results for this exact system with the RX 6650 XT as well as the RTX 3060. I'll show all three cards performance side by side with a lot of additional information like CPU utilization, uh, all the different clock speeds, system memory usage, video memory usage, all of that. For modern graphics cards in this price range, I don't think it's really a question whether or not they can perform at 1080p, so my target resolution for testing was 1440p. This also pushes the cards more to their limits and ensure that we force the bottlenecks onto the graphics cards and not the CPU, that i5-12400. Uh, for reference, resizable bar was enabled for all the runs across all cards. I tested on Windows 11, RAM XMP was enabled, and the CPU and GPUs were all running at stock, so no overclocks at all. So yeah, sit back, relax, and enjoy the benchmarks.
terms of the results, there was no one true best card that dominated across the board in every single test. They each had their victories. However, looking at the summary of results, we do see the AMD RX 6650 XT, which is the most inexpensive card out of the three, coming in with the most victories when it comes to gaming. The ARC A770 did have its moments though, like with Apex Legends, which is a little surprising because that's a DX11 title, which ARC cards are known to fall behind on. You can see this in the Fortnite and Rainbow Six tests, where in DX12, it can keep up just fine with the other two cards, but switch those over to DX11 and you see a big drop in performance with Rainbow Six being remarkably bad. In terms of the other workloads I tested, Nvidia did lead the charge when it came to uh, Blender and Premiere Pro, though AMD did score the best by a little bit in Photoshop, and Intel pretty much came in second place across the board in like the Blender, Photoshop, Premiere Pro tests. So what are my final thoughts on the A770, and I guess the Intel Arc cards in general? Well, from a glass half full perspective, I'm pleasantly surprised that Intel was able to pull this off on their first attempt returning to the mid-range consumer desktop graphics card space. Uh, do they have offerings that compete with the most top-end cards from both AMD and NVIDIA? No. Uh, and I think that's perfectly fine. They're hitting the most popular segment of the market, and I'm optimistic they will build up from there. From my unboxing of the card, to installing it, to getting the drivers, and then to running the variety of tests, I personally didn't encounter any deal-breaking errors or bugs. Uh, and sure, there were stuff like the performance losses in titles like Rainbow Six on DX11, but I think those things can and will be fixed over time with driver updates. Otherwise, the user experience wasn't all too different compared to the many AMD and Nvidia cards that I've used before it. From a glass half empty perspective, however, based on the results that we just saw, you really have to ask yourself, why would anyone bother to buy an Intel graphics card over say AMD or Nvidia at this point in time? It's not coming in at a significant discount despite lagging behind in performance in a couple of areas. So why would anyone bother? And the answer is something that I actually left out in all my testing, and that is anything to do with AV1 hardware encoding, because honestly, I'm not super well versed at all when it comes to that, and I'm still rapidly trying to catch up on my knowledge of it. If you want to watch someone who specifically covers streaming, encoding, decoding, that type of content in really great detail, definitely check out Epos Vox, who has made multiple videos covering it. But it's just not something that I personally have the skill set to be able to test and report results on at the moment. So my apologies for that. I understand what AV1 is. It's a next generation codec standard. I understand the benefits of it. I know for a fact that I will personally benefit from it in terms of stream quality for my weekly streams that I do. The bitrate improvements is going to help me out in terms of less data usage. It's also going to result in smaller video file sizes. So that means less of your storage being taken up by a given video. All that sounds great, but none of the software that I use right now even supports it at a hardware level. Premiere Pro doesn't, Handbrake doesn't, OBS doesn't. Actually, I take that one back. I think they just released an OBS update that does have hardware encoding, but it's still a beta version and only the newest NVIDIA cards, not the Intel Arc cards, are supported. So yeah, there's just not enough wide adoption for it at the moment for most people to care in my opinion. Uh, so Intel being the first out of the gate with this doesn't really mean much because by the time it is more widely adopted, both NVIDIA and AMD are going to have cards out with the same capabilities. So back to my question, why should anyone buy an Intel Arc card? And I think it boils down simply to this. Do you want to support an underdog or do you like to tinker around with new stuff and have the capabilities to troubleshoot should the need arise? And that's pretty much it. I would personally be fine running an Intel Arc card in my personal system since I meet both of those criteria. However, if I frame the question as, would you personally recommend an Intel Arc card to a close family member or friend, particularly someone who's not that computer savvy? or would you build them a system with one of these in it, then my answer is going to be probably not. I'm just going to point them to AMD if they want to maximize, you know, gaming price to performance, or NVIDIA if they specifically need, like, the ray tracing performance, DLSS, NVIDIA broadcast, and stuff like that. My answer would, however, quickly change, though, if Intel, for whatever reason, decided to slash their prices to something like sub $300, like what we're seeing with the RX 6650 XTs already, then that's going to be a different conversation.
But yeah, I think I've talked enough for one video, so now it's y'all's turn. What do you think about the new Intel Arc cards, whether it be conclusions formed from what I showed in this video or what you've seen from other tech content creators and reviewers? Is it generally a positive opinion, a negative one, maybe a neutral? Uh, let me know down in the comments below. I'm curious to hear your thoughts. That's going to wrap it up for this video, though. Hope you all enjoyed and found this either entertaining or helpful in one way or another. I want to thank you all, as always, for watching and for continuing to support the channel. Big thanks to the channel members and the super gifters for going above and beyond. And, of course, thanks to Micro Center for teaming up with me and helping me make this video possible. As always, be safe out there, and I'll see you all down in the comments as well as in the next stream and or video. Bye.